there! My name is Sylvia North. I am a New Zealand registered dietitian and representative for Celiac New Zealand and the Medical Advisory Panel. This webinar was brought to you by Celiac New Zealand and the Medical Advisory Panel. For more information about how we support those living with celiac disease in New Zealand, you can follow either of these links to the Celiac New Zealand website. So for this session, we're going to talk about what celiac disease is. You might be watching this because you've been diagnosed with celiac disease, or you might know someone who's been recently diagnosed with celiac disease. So in this talk, we're going to first go through some of the terminology associated with celiac disease, go into more detail about what happens in someone with celiac disease and why avoiding gluten is so important. And then we're going to cover some of the symptoms that we see in adults and children. So to start off, celiac disease is a permanent intestinal reaction to dietary gluten. Permanent. And when we look at gluten in more detail, gluten is, 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 this, is this protein that's found in various cereal grains, including wheat, rye barley, and oats. So gluten is actually made of two proteins, gliadin and glutenin. And the interesting thing about gliadin and glutenin, it's when they link together, they create this really strong elastic protein that is really characteristic of that, of that chewiness found in gluten-containing grains. But that, that property is also why it's used in a lot of processed foods or food processing. The part gliadin is thought to be the part that is immunoreactive. So that's the part that triggers the reaction we see in people with celiac disease. So the other important part of celiac disease is knowing that it's an autoimmune condition. So auto means self, and there are a number of autoimmune type conditions um, that, uh, that, that people can develop. And so what autoimmune means is it's, it's excessive activity of the immune system. So that's the same immune system you have that plays a role in uh, fighting off viruses, fighting off bacteria if you get sick. It's the same immune system that helps your body clean up a, a scratch on your knee or a cut. Your immune system goes in and cleans up if there's any bacteria and helps encourage healing. Now, when we have in autoimmune conditions, we see overactivity of certain parts of the immune system that specifically starts to target areas of the body. And if your immune system is targeting an area of the body, we end up with inflammation in that area. So that's almost like that, that bump or scrape on your knee. Inflammation is associated with that redness and heat in that area. So if you think inflammation, think pain and redness and heat. Now, another important thing to know about autoimmune conditions is when one person has one autoimmune condition, they do have a greater chance or likelihood of developing another one later in life. So that's the case with people with celiac disease. We also see a higher um, chance of developing conditions such as thyroid disease or type 1 diabetes. So who's more likely to develop celiac disease? Uh, we think of celiac disease is a partially hereditary or partially genetic condition. So that means you can only develop it if you inherit the gene from your parents. Now that doesn't mean if you have the gene you're going to get it. It's only a risk factor. Um, but that's really interesting to know because it means that we can use the gene to rule out whether or not some people have a chance of developing it. If you have a pre-existing autoimmune condition, you're also more likely to develop celiac disease. So we see this in uh, people with type 1 diabetes. They're regularly screened for celiac disease. If you have a family member who's had celiac disease, then, uh, then, it's, um, then we're, we're more likely to see a child or a parent also develop celiac disease and that becomes really interesting when you start tracing family history. If a child is diagnosed then we might look into uh, whether celiac disease is related to grandma's tummy problems as well. Turner's syndrome and Down syndrome are also associated with a high risk of developing celiac disease. So let's go into a bit more detail about the intestinal reactions that we see with gluten. So if we recap on the role of the immune system, 
so the immune, it, it is an autoimmune condition and we we, we spoke about how in autoimmune you see specific targeting in a specific area of the body. What happens with celiac disease is gluten triggers the immune system and this results in gluten attacking or targeting the lining of the small intestine. And as the lining of the small intestine receives ongoing attack from the immune system, we start to see more damage and inflammation in this area. So if you look at the cartoon on the right of your screen, we have a cartoon of a healthy villi or a healthy small intestine. And so typically a, a healthy small intestine has these lovely long finger-like protrusions. And the reason why those finger-like protrusions are really important is they create a lot of surface area. So that when food flushes, food and nutrients flush through our gut, our finger-like villi are able to sweep through and they can break down and help digest food and they help, help absorb those nutrients. Now you can imagine the inflammation in the small intestine, a bit like if you were a cartoon Mickey Mouse and you hit those villi, those fingers with a big hammer. And you know in a cartoon how they go really big and swollen? That's almost what might happen uh, to your small intestine villi. So as they become inflamed and, and damaged, those villi become really puffy, they they and they start they almost kind of lose those long crypts, they can start kind of sticking together. And what was a long uh, finger like uh, large surface area type structure becomes really densely packed. It almost becomes quite flat. So we we've got this this flat flat type structure on the top and that actually means we've lost a lot of surface area. With a lot less surface area we see that you can't digest as much micronutrients, we can't absorb as much micronutrients and over time this means that we're not getting the vitamins and minerals that we need for our body to thrive. So this can lead to your vitamin and mineral deficiencies which are associated with many of the symptoms uh, we see in celiac disease. But another consequence of that ongoing inflammation or ongoing swelling is symptoms across the body that aren't even so related to micronutrients but might be related to inflammation. And so your, your, your dermatitis, herpetiformis, which we see in celiac disease, might be uh, another one of those symptoms associated with inflammation. So let's go into a bit more detail about the symptoms in, in adults and then we'll also cover symptoms in children in people with celiac disease. And I've, I've broken them into three categories here, but you know, it's sometimes there's a lot of crossover and they're kind of interrelated. And the other thing to really understand about symptoms in celiac disease is that everyone's really individual. You could have only one, you could have several, you might only have a number of nutrient deficiencies that have absolutely no gut symptoms. And this is why diagnosis and proper testing is really important because just uh, because just because if you've got really mild symptoms doesn't mean that your treatment or your gluten-free diet can be more mild, so to speak. So. In this diagram, they do break it down into some more frequent and less frequent symptoms. Uh, so you can see in the green, you've got your less frequent symptoms, um, and and your, your your blue are the more common ones that will first show up uh, when you first uh, have a conversation with your doctor. So when we look at nutrient deficiencies, weight loss is really common, and that's because you're not absorbing the nutrients, you're not absorbing the food, and it's just going straight through your system. Hair loss can sometimes develop as a result of micronutrient insufficiency. We sometimes see in adults dental enamel defects, so you might get more um, cavities, uh, sensitive teeth. Iron deficiency is a really common symptom, and and so you know, typically a lot of people are going to show up to their doctor with fatigue, and so we can measure iron deficiency with a blood test. Anemia is the, the clinical deficiency state of iron uh, when there's not enough iron in the body and we can also develop anemia from a number of micronutrient deficiencies. It might just be general lethargy, weakness. Poor healing is a very common symptom of nutrient insufficiencies 
and we very commonly first see this in the mouth. So if the mouth, if we're getting lots of mouth ulcers, or if you're getting cuts and bruises that aren't quite healing properly, that can be related to micronutrient inadequacy. And one of the last ones that we don't commonly see with related to micronutrient deficiencies is low bone density. And that might not show up for several years, even decades, after not absorbing enough nutrients. Gastrointestinal conditions, this is typically what we associate with, associate with celiac disease, and that's your diarrhea, constipation. It might just be a, a big bloated stomach or pain. And But what's really characteristic of celiac disease is the nausea and vomiting. And when someone's been diagnosed, usually a little, a little bit further down the line, they might start to really associate this severe nausea, maybe dry retching and vomiting that they experience when they consume gluten. There are a lot of symptoms outside of the gut as well, and so that's that's not only, it, it might be a combination of the nutrient and the inadequacy, then it might also be the excessive inflammation in the, in the body. But it's very common to see mood changes, anxiety, depression, just difficulty concentrating, that brain fog. Uh, skin problems are quite common, so there is a characteristic rash seen in people with celiac disease called dermatitis herpetiformis and and what's really important about that is there is if it is related to celiac disease there is no level of cream or steroid that will actually fix that problem unless you correct the underlying issue which means gluten-free diet joint pain and muscle aches now they might be related to so much inflammation in the body and what's interesting about once you do start a gluten-free diet this lifting of inflammation and saturation of, of better nutrients coming into the body sometimes feels like you know you've you've backed the you've turned back the age clock another ten years because people just feel like all of this this aging um, which was actually celiac disease can can lift. So the symptoms in children are relatively similar to what we see in adults. Um, there might be problems with weight gain, weight. Poor, poor weight gain, poor growth. Really characteristic in children is this is this large bloated stomach. And you might we might also have a child who's had ongoing issues with tummy upsets, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation. It's all quite generalised and all muddled together. General fatigue. Uh, it's it's a it's a little bit. It's quite hard to pick up. But it might be a combination of tiredness, irritability, difficulty concentrating. Um, and all of that might even be related to an iron deficiency or a nutrient deficiency. And as that clinically develops, anemia might show up as a, a real paleness to the child's skin tone. One other really interesting area where celiac disease might be detected is in the teeth. And uh, this might happen particularly from a uh, child who's been celiac from a very young age. They might not have been absorbing a lot of that calcium required for teeth development. And so that can be picked up, uh, potentially by a dentist as well. So the treatment for celiac disease is, is a strict gluten-free diet for life. The only way to reverse the damage and lift all of these problems is by avoiding gluten and that's the also the positive side is is this condition can be com completely alleviated by following a gluten-free diet avoiding gluten allows the body to repair the damage and alleviate the symptoms so that means that if we cut if we stop the reaction at the root if we stop the immune system from targeting the gut then these these villi will heal and they'll start absorbing nutrients. The inflammation that's widespread across the body will cool off and, 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 and we can get a really positive result. Now what's really important to know that actually even a really small amounts of gluten can cause issues. So because the immune system is so highly tuned to picking up small particles, so small particles of bacteria or viruses, is also really good at picking up small particles of gluten. So that means you need to avoid gluten, even if you think your symptoms are mild. And if you continue to eat gluten, even if you know you think you can you can put up with the symptoms, 
there are some serious long-term health complications that you can put yourself at risk of. So the gluten-free diet is the treatment, it's the only treatment, and it's really important to take seriously. So in summary, celiac disease is a permanent intestinal reaction to dietary gluten. It, it causes damage to the small intestine, which can lead to a range of gut and non-gut related symptoms. So it's, it's, not, it's, not always, um, it's not always the bloating, constipation and diarrhea. It's partially genetic, which means that if you have the gene, you, you can only get it if you have the gene. But if you have the gene, you're not guaranteed to get it. Okay, the treatment for celiac disease is a strict gluten-free diet for life. Strict gluten-free diet for life. And that is because consuming even very small amounts of gluten can sustain damage. So this means, again, strict avoidance is required. So... Thank you for listening. This presentation was prepared by myself, Sylvia, and my colleague Margaret. We're both representatives from the Celiac New Zealand Medical Advisory Panel and are registered dietitians. And thank you for listening.